Good afternoon to you at home, in the office, behind a face mask, or wherever you are during this strange time. And we're live. Welcome to Daily Maverick's new Our Burning Planet webinar series, brought to you by APSA. And most critically, hi to our Maverick insiders. We here at Daily Maverick are absolutely zero without each and every one of you. And it's a privilege to be walking this road with you. I'm Tiara Walters. I'm a senior science journalist with Our Burning Planet. And over the next hour, we're talking about the climate crisis as well as global change and how Daily Maverick's Global Change Unit, Our Burning Planet, is tackling all of this. Now, if you're a climate skeptic or even somewhere on that line, I do hope that you've joined us too. And I also hope that as this chat develops, we'll convince you that business and reporters and civilians can sit around one table and do what our species learned millions of years ago out there in the dangerous savannah. And that's being a species of cooperation, one that can use a big brain to solve the problems life throws at us. We also hope that you will sign up to our free Our Burning Planet newsletter, which will bring you all the latest investigations straight to your inbox by some of South Africa's finest global change reporters every two weeks. Please keep an eye on the chat window for the link. Now, as for our panelists, I'm honored to share this platform with two stalwarts in the field of sustainability and global change. Firstly, David Rennick, Head of Investment Banking at APSA. David, we are truly grateful to you for supporting what's now the biggest environmental reporting unit in Africa. Welcome to you. Good to be here, thank you. And then Gillian Green, the calm in every storm and OBP's visionary managing editor who has to daily juggle a group of very strong world journalists or herding cats, as we like to say, behind the scenes. Thanks for joining us, Jill, for what I actually think is, is a really special moment for both of us and, and every person who has helped to grow this unit from the ground up. Thanks, Tiara. It's good to be here and good to, to have a, looking forward to a robust discussion around business and its role in, in the climate crisis and global change. And finally, to you in our audience, we are taking your questions about private sector responsibility during global change after this chat. So please post your questions in the chat window. Julian, over to you. Uh, just to get the ball rolling. For those of us who haven't followed our burning planet from the start, how did this unit first come to be in September 2018? What do you see as our highlights to date and um, why a relaunch at this stage? Thanks, Tiara. Um, you know, the Our Burning Planet unit um, is really driven by personal interests in what's happening with our world. Um, mm. There were two major events that, that really galvanized, galvanized our, our move into this into this particular reporting field. One was the the Cape drought, um, I think in 2017 or so, you know, Cape Town approaching day zero, one of South Africa's major cities, you know, looking to down the barrel of a gun towards a day when there would be no water coming out of the taps. Right. Um, right. And then, you know, we had we had reporters reporting on that news event, you know, from from a, on a day to day um, basis. And um, then you had the the intergovernmental um, panel on climate change really warning us that that we were warming the, the world up at a much faster rate than than we had anticipated and so when you looked when we looked at those two big events let's call them that we realized that actually something needs to change um, two it was really and it was really two of our senior guys that that really got the ball rolling um, Kevin Bloom and Richard Poplack over a, mm -hmm. a a whiskey were chatting about mm -hmm. particularly the 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 um, IPCC report, and and out of those chats 
came this germ of an idea to put climate crisis and global change firmly in the front seat of our reporting. Um, mm -hmm. and, and at that point, it really just was Kevin initially and then yourself, um, Tiara, you know, doing increment and uh, not incremental, um, some stories occasionally as it fitted in with everything else and all your other responsibilities. But now we're at a point where we have 10 people focused on climate crisis and global change reporting. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that that's showing you the commitment that Daily Maverick and the team has to, to really championing the, these causes. Mm -hmm. um, just today, we've, we've brought on our, our two newest recruits um, to, to the team. And, and, you know, already we are seeing the, the amount of content and journalism being produced from the team just being so diverse, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, yeah, and I, I just think it's it's just just the start of what we're going to be able to do, and it's yeah. all and you know it's it's each one of us in the team knows what the vision and mission of of our burning planet is, and and rearing to go. Yeah, yeah. And Jill, what would you consider some of our biggest uh, highlights to date? They've been quite diverse. I mean, if yeah. you just have to look in the in the in the last week or so, we've got the car power ship deal, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's not going to go ahead. Thanks to it, the initial reporting from Tony Carney, one of our, mm. our environmental reporters here, who first raised the red flag about how, how the, the deal was sort of, you know, being manipulated to to go ahead or, or shortcuts being taken. Yeah. Um, Kevin Bloom's work on on, on, on land, um, you know, from the, from the Limpopo districts, uh, the Eastern case, Olobeni, yourself and Don Pinnock on the Pangolin um, investigation. I mean, that was a global first, you yeah, know, a, a yeah. global exclusive linking potentially the, the coronavirus outbreak to Pangolin. Um, yeah. And I mean, that, that was just a, a few. The, the yeah. list is long. Yes. And uh, we, we are placing an emphasis on go a global change uh, as opposed to just the climate crisis um, uh, and and when i say just the climate crisis not to diminish it but uh, if you know we didn't hypothetically speaking we didn't have the climate crisis we would also have the biodiversity crisis um, and the pollution crisis so this is why we are looking at global change as a whole right yeah that's correct i mean i i think sometimes we box ourselves in when we think of the climate crisis that it's only got to do with global warming uh, but but when you when you start really unpacking unpacking it, all these these different aspects feed into it. It's, it's about the biodiversity collapse. It's about pollution. It's about food insecurity. It's about energy and the just trans transition from coal to renewable. Um, it is about um, land use and agriculture. So uh, you know I think we need to to start expanding our understanding of what climate crisis and climate change is all about because ultimately it is about how we as humans interact with our world on various different levels. Mm. David, this, uh, this brings me to the elephant in the room. Our burning planet is, it's a no fear, no favor unit. We don't tackle safe issues. And we spoke about this just before we started. We were in, in the waiting room. Uh, so, you know, in, in short, uh, in summary, some sponsors might see us as a, as a PR risk. Why has APSA taken the leap to support our work? Thanks for the question. I think it is as follows. Absa have had a firm view that they want to play a shaping role in society. And there is few bigger threats than the potential environmental impact on our society, both not within South Africa, but all across the continent. So in some respects, I think it's high risk not to be involved in this agenda. I think it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's a difficult topic, but I think it's come from a consistent viewpoint, in my opinion, or growing consistent viewpoint, that people actually want to facilitate this change and they want to see this change. And when we when we mm -hmm. developed our whole sustainable financing strategy, we were quite firm of the view that it needed three key pillars. One was how do financial institutions manage the risk? How do they promote products and services that are that of a, of a sustainable nature, both from a um, inclusive growth as well as environmental protection? 
And then how do they deal with, how do they inform their clients and drive their client strategies? But the third equally important pillar we decided as an organization is how do we be on the front foot in helping to try shift and drive policy? Because one of, one of the key things is to really get the ball moving faster is around our opinion around a need for more standardization, for more policies, for more disclosures. And by voicing, utilizing this as one of the many channels, we think is a very positive to try to deliver some of those objectives. Right, we have some interesting questions from the uh, audience coming in, but we're going to keep those uh, for after our chat uh, with uh, David and Gillian. But just a reminder, if you would like to submit a question about business responsibility during this time of global change, please do so via the chat window. Uh, Gillian, uh, at Our Burning Planet, we are firmly and foremost journalists. But just like we wouldn't, uh, I guess, debate the pros and cons of apartheid, we wouldn't debate the existence of climate change, well, at least not anymore. So we need values and, and principles, which some might interpret as ideology. So how do we tell the, the, the business story, the private sector uh, uh, story um, critically without becoming activists i think that's that's a key question i think you know um given the topic that we are covering it's easy to see our journalists as activists but our burning planet is not an activist unit you know um, first and foremost we are journalists like you say we are investigative journalists um and and we're going to bring the brand of journalism that is daily maverick to everything that we do in our burning planet mm -hmm. um you know, it, it's, we have to be committed to the tenets of journalism. And, and one of those is to defend truth, to, to, to report the truth and then defend it. So in our reporting on business, you know, it, business will say one thing, the activists will say one thing. It's not our job to quote them equally and both. Our job is to go out and, and find the truth. You know, there's there's an age old saying in journalism, if somebody tells you it's raining and another person says it's dry, it's your job as a journalist to go outside and see what the truth is and then report mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So that is what we're going to be doing at, at, at our burning planet. Um, you know, uh, business has a role to play um, and, and business needs to be challenged in meeting that role. You know, um, the, the planet is not just for you and I. You know, if business wants to survive, they've got to get involved. Yeah. And that's and that's just where we're going to continue to put feet to fire and ask those hard questions and um, you know, demand answers. Mm -hmm. So David, uh, just as, as journalists can't be activists, um, banks, even with the best intent, live in that liminal space of funding industries that impact on the planet. And yet, COVID-19 is a reality check for all of us. Like climate change, it's a natural disaster. Its origins are natural. It's a zoonotic disease. There is really no real evidence at this stage that it's leaked from a lab. So in terms of risk and natural disaster, have the warnings from from the natural world uh, in, in the COVID era, given banks pause to heighten their response to warnings from the climate era, and um, and maybe to put you on, on the spot just a little bit, and to what extent should banks be activists? Okay, so I think there's two parts of the question. The, the first one is around how financial services and banks in particular assess risk. Um, and we've seen in, in just over 10 years, we've seen the global financial crisis of 2008, which really shook the financial industry to its core. You also see that we're in the middle of the COVID pandemic. And, and what, it, what it does illustrate is all the clever models banks do around one in 10 year scenarios, one, 20 year, one in 20 year scenarios, which people have often kind of put in the bottom drawer and said, well, that's never gonna happen actually has happened right mm -hmm. and and so when we think about when we think about environmental risk 
it's definitely elevated within financial institutions. You know, most of them now have sustainability risk as a principal risk. It's as important as credit, and it clearly interlinks with them. So I think there there has been a the work was always done, and I think that's reflected in you know through these various crises, very little uh, or banks not going out of business, banks not going into liquidation, not being distressed, particularly in, in the COVID period, because I think banks have understood these risks and have also been quite well regulated, particularly in the South African context. But there is no doubt um, how people are thinking about credit risk and valuations and modeling has, has, is, is being influenced by the moves within climate change significantly. The other is, is the point around you know, a bank being perhaps an unlikely activist. I think particularly the bigger financial institutions that simply touch so much in the economy. You know, some some of the the stats are there, right? You know, the, if you believe them or not, that's up to you. But you know, the the talk is that a two percent increase in global temperature may result in a four percent increase in temperature in South Africa. And and mm -hmm. and Jillian was referring to some real life examples of that. You know, we sit with. Youth unemployment above 50%, or overall unemployment above 30%, an increase in debt to GDP. And the reason why I quote these numbers is that we need to have an active dialogue because, as was mentioned earlier, the just transition is as important as the transition. You know, we sit with very different dynamics across the continent of Africa, which we need to manage. So, stepping up to facilitate the debate may allow us, hopefully, to make better decisions and foster decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. A reminder to the audience, please, if you'd like to submit a question about businesses' role in the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and so on, please do so via the chat window. We'll try and get through as uh, many of those questions as possible. Now, Gillian, back to you. Um, as both Daily Maverick and our Burning Planet Managing Editor, you process vast amounts of copy related to the intersection between planet and everything else. And uh, certainly asset managers like BlackRock, which has trillions under management, are making the right noises by showing their intent to divest from fossil fuels. But what does the news cycle tell us about reality versus intent? So, Divesting from fossil fuels seems to be be the buzzword at the moment. You know, um, our inboxes are full of press releases of different companies talking about divesting um, from fossil fuels and and moving more to renewable renewable sources of of energy. Um, the intention is great, you know, but intention must be followed by action. Mm. Um, and I think. Because it, it, it's so much of a buzzword now, it's our responsibility as journalists to, to keep track of what various different companies' promises are around this particular aspect. You know, um, it's, it's to hold them accountable for, for the promises. You know, I, I'm sure you guys have, have heard the news around ESCOM looking at, at um, funding for renewable energy. I mean, I think that's, that's a great move. Um, but it can just be a policy document without any um, real implementation. Um, our responsibility then comes into to, to really keep asking the questions and, and keep the focus on, on the change from intention to action. Yes. Um, it's, it's too easy for, for this kind of conversation to be lost in the, the mad news cycle that is South Africa. You know, um, there's always competing interests. There's always competing news articles. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I come back, I come back again to, uh, to it being our responsibility. You know, it's, it's, it's just too easy simply to, to make a statement and move on to the next thing. The cycle just allows it. Um, we've got to continue asking the questions. We've got to say, okay, yes, yes, here's your, your, your public statements. Where's the, the follow through? You know, yeah. what's happening in, in terms of, of actual change? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, David, uh, this brings me back to you. And, and I am really interested in this tension between actual 
a private sector change, actual corporate change, and everyone jumping on the the green bandwagon, as it were, and uh, essentially uh, greenwashing corporate images. Um, and, and that's always going to be a, a challenge. Business is always going to, uh, to want to be part of the trends. But how do you, um, uh, in, in your line of work, uh, what checks and balances do you have in place uh, to to guard against uh, that kind of thing, where it's it's all show or more show than actual substance and change? And 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 I guess the other um, side to that is it's also a question of credibility, right? It's you really have to to get uh, the public on on your side when I think many of us are are quite disillusioned with um, the with information it grow it, it's a very it's a very interesting point and we've seen it already around this i suppose this concept of greenwashing and is all of this just a, a feel-good factor because everyone everyone understands the the storyline right and so is this is just a good pr by saying you're going to do things and i think one of the one of the inhibitors or what, what's what's not coming through quickly enough is a little bit of the stick versus the carrot the carrot being the feel-good factor the stick being actually legislation, disclosures, policies, and that needs to come that that needs to come through a lot quicker, and that will drive some of the change. On the other hand, you know we shouldn't underestimate consumer activism, shareholder activism, and bondholder activism. You've seen it mm -hmm. a number of instances. You've seen it in in the likes of the U.S. with shareholder activism against entities like Exxon. And we've even seen it at a number of AGMs or banks within the South African market where people are forcing a lot more disclosure, are forcing targets around you know, no longer funding fossil fuels and the like. And I think it's all very positive. So the, the institutional community actually has a very big role, institutional investor community has a very big role to play in driving this change. And they don't have to wait for regulation. Mm. It, it all comes down to their their pension funds, which which is the capital they represent, and it almost comes down to the man in the street wanting to procure goods and services which are of a sustainable nature from an environmental perspective, fuels that whole asset management community, fuels the institutional investors, and they actually have a real voice. And we really started to see some change at at a at a board level within companies, not just in in South Africa but internationally. And then if we, if we just take a step back, there are a number of community groups or organizations, whether it's uh, the Banking Association of, of South Africa or the, the, the National CEO Forum, which are coming together to talk about this. But I think the talking has to lead to solutions which have to lead to actions. And, the, and, the, and that's what we need to drive. And I think the, the important piece, and, and I think Gillian also touched on it, is in some respects, the easy discussion is possibly the bookends. The easy discussion mm -hmm. is power generation, fossil fuels. It's easy identifying coal-fired power stations and coal mining. And the other bookend, it's easy to identify renewable energy and how good it is. But it's it's the carbon emissions that happen in between, which is mm -hmm. also the next layer. It's what's happening in the transport industry, the agricultural industry. You know, the engineering and manufacturing. So we, we need to we need to go to the next layer of thinking. It's not just about the bookends. It's about all of that which sits in between, which we need to address. Mm -hmm. Tiara, if I may, if I may come in there, I think I think David's absolutely correct when he says, you know, the the business business role needs to be of leadership. It can't be in terms of of just waiting for the legislation to force the change. Um, mm -hmm. Changes can be made within each individual company without necessarily saying, okay, we need to meet clause 567 of section B of, of the, 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 the latest um, regulations from the Department of Environmental Affairs and, and, and Forestry. Um, the action can be driven from within mm. and must mm. be driven from within because mm. it, it's only when we all take on this this challenge and make those changes within within everything that we do without necessarily having that stick to say you better do this or you're going to face financial consequences that we would make broad broad 
broader change in 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 what's happening. Mm -hmm. David, the International Energy Agency told us earlier this year uh, that we cannot fund any more fossil fuel projects if we are to meet our Paris Treaty targets by 2050. It's a, it's a clear and, and sobering directive from an industry mouthpiece. Yet, it's, and this is what's fascinating to me, its best case scenario for getting to net zero predicts that we'll still need 24 million barrels of oil per day in 2050. So if that is, is really the case, how do banks simply walk away from fossil fuel investments when we might uh, regrettably still need oil and gas to help power mid-century society? Uh, this is a very difficult question, but I think that's that's the heart of this kind of concept of just transition. So in other words, you know, we, we all know that, you know, the, I, sp I quoted some of the statistics in South Africa, I think we all know, I think the World Health Organization that said something like three billion people still rely on hard fossils for daily production of energy. That's the burning of wood and coal just for basic survival. So there's a there is a huge variance as depends in which markets you operate. So this concept of transitional uh, fuels is is a hotly debated one. And I think that's exactly where you're going. Can can we can we cut out coal? But is gas a transition fuel, which is not is not as bad as as burning coal, but it's also not as clean as renewable energy. I think it it's complicated, but I think there is a I get comfort that the discussions are being held. The the people need to understand you need to manage um, inclusive growth uh, with environmental protection, but you're also seeing a huge amount of investment in research and development, whether it comes to bringing in the unit cost of production down for renewable energy, but also huge amounts going into battery storage and the tech and the technology which sits behind energy storage, which is a huge uh, inhibitor at this point in time to actually accelerating the transition from fossil fuels to green energy when it comes to power production. Mm, mm, okay. So, so uh, yeah, I, I guess that... Um, that, that brings me to, uh, um, I think, quite an important question. Um, and that is about whether or not um, South Africa is doing everything that it should to create that uh, enabling environment for renewable energy production to thrive. Um, that certainly hasn't been the case for, uh, for uh, <laughs> I guess, forever, up until now. Um, and uh, so let's take one example. Government has just announced a dramatic new 100 megawatt cap for generation outside ESCOM. Um, and Jill mentioned earlier that Reuters broke the news today that ESCOM, um, Africa's biggest greenhouse gas emitter, is proposing a $10 billion plan to global lenders to replace its coal-fired stations with renewables by 2050. So David, where do you see the private banking sector's role in all of this? Firstly, really truly supporting smaller power, uh, independent power producers. And secondly, getting involved in, in, in this really um, exciting ESCOM proposal. Look, look I think that there, there, there's, there's two very interesting facts here. One is that there is an enormous amount of capital that is available to be deployed in renewable energy from the banking sector, from the institutional investors, from development finance industry, in development financial institutions, as well as global players within this within the, within this theme. So the capital is there. What often you need is what's going to drive businesses to take on these projects themselves. And in some respects, the fact that we have a power shortage actually creates the impetus for companies to do this. So, mm -hmm. you know, if there was an abundance of power with, with it, within this market, then it becomes less of a business. It becomes less of a short term business imperative. Long term, we, we all fully aware that we need to reduce use of dirty power and we need to take on clean power. But in an economy which is not particularly growing, 
the small business or medium-sized business, it becomes a hard decision around additional capital expenditure to go down this path. However, there is a real necessity for power. So we need to actually take advantage of it. So I think if, if this gets rolled out similarly to kind of the IPP projects, which we've seen being very successful, I think you'll see a lot of growth in the space. And I think small businesses, large businesses are gearing up to take advantage of this. Mm -hmm. Going back to the Reuters announcement, again, if, it, if, it's, if it's procured in the same way as we've seen the big renewable energy projects uh, within South Africa, there's not going to be a shortage of people wanting to facilitate that expansion. As I said, th there's a lot of participants in the global community that are very interested in the renewable space in South Africa. And I do think there is a lot of capacity within institutional investors to support these projects. So I don't think it's, uh, capital is not a constraint. Capacity is not a constraint. It's, it's a case of, is there going to be clear contract and policy terms that will drive it forward quickly? Mm, okay. Well, I have to say that um, I'm getting, my phone is hot with um, uh, questions from our webinar, Angel Nicole. She has been fielding questions from the audience. And um, I think it's time to move over to uh, some of those. Um, and uh, we haven't really, we've spoken quite generally, but we haven't spoken about supermarkets uh, and, and their role um, in, in, in the private sector and as, I guess, private sector activists in uh, sustainability. Rosemary Wildsmith Cromarty is asking, why can't we pressure big supermarkets like Woolworths to stop packaging most of their products in plastic. She says, my recycle bin is full after two days when I have been shopping at Woolworths. And yes, I should boycott them. I know some of you will say, but we don't have enough fresh produce outlets for us to choose from. Um, uh, spa actually implies, uh, sorry, spa actually supplies food fresh without plastics so other supermarkets should follow suit. They need to walk the talk. Uh, so uh, I, I'm not sure which of our panelists would like to um, take that uh, question, but, but Jill, maybe it's, it's something that uh, you can address in, in the sense that um, our inboxes are full of um, press releases of how uh, well Woolworths and other um, supermarkets are doing in terms of sustainability, and yet, our recycle bins are full of plastic. It is a massive problem. Yeah, I think I think um, the 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 question is on point. Um, single use plastics is a major problem. Um, we need to we need to put pressure on on policymakers, um, on supermarkets, on ourselves to to move away from from choosing single use. Uh, Wilberts, funnily enough, has done away with plastic shopping bags. Um, if you want a shopping bag at, at Woolworths now, you have to pay six rand for a recyclable um, material bag um, that yeah. you can use that you can use more. But I agree fully. Can um, I can I just ask, is that all Woolworths stores? Because I think they are trying to do it um, at uh, one hundred percent capacity, but I'm not sure it's all Woolworths stores at this. Point. I haven't I haven't done a, a, a survey at all Woolworths stores, but but certainly yeah. the ones that I've been into recently have have offered yeah. the the either no bag or the material bag. So yes. perhaps it's a matter of scaling up. Um, yes. But in terms of, in terms of packaging, food packaging in this in, in in South Africa is is crazy. Everything comes wrapped um, in in cellophane that is really not worth recycling. So mm. often, even if when you put your recycling out, that is not taken by by your your informal recycler. Um, you know, it ends up in in the landfills. It ends up in the ocean. Mm. So mm. you know, I've heard of people going to supermarkets and as an act of activism take off the, the plastic right there, they're in the shop once they've paid for it so that it be becomes the supermarket's problem to deal with with what you what to do with the single plastic, single use plastic. Mm. Um, mm. And I do think that we we should, as as consumers, use our voice more actively. You know? Yes, yeah. Uh, David, uh, maybe we can consider this one as a, uh, a thought experiment. Um, so just as uh, major asset managers are attempting to divest from fossil fuels, can one maybe consider somewhere down the line and, and hopefully sooner than later, the kind of proposal that would see 
uh, banks um, uh, providing less support to uh, plastic punting, using, producing businesses and industries. And, and it is, if we are talking about global change, I mean, that is fundamental, it's critical. Um, our oceans are choking in plastic. It's, it's not just a, a fringe subject anymore. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a major crisis. I think, I think it goes to the point I raised earlier. It's that whole um, middle section. It's not the fossil fuels and it's not renewable energy. It's all of that which sits in the middle, which is the next evolution or the more complex thinking which needs to take place. And a lot of financial institutions, including our own, are building quite complex models to understand the impact of these businesses in their whole production cycle to the end consumer. Well, what, what's interesting is you're seeing a lot of large corporates um, elsewhere in the world, and you're starting to see it in South Africa, when it comes to their suppliers, are demanding a lot from them in terms of their commitment to environmental protection. So you're seeing it both from, I think the banks are getting there, but perhaps a bit slow, but you're seeing particularly your large multinational corporates are pushing the behavior of their suppliers significantly to become far more environmentally conscious. Mm. Mm, okay, we have a question from uh, David LePage. Um, it's a comment as well as a question, and I'm I'm going to read um, all of it. Uh, I am very glad that Daily Maverick is covering the subject. Thank you. Uh, and you have indeed done excellent work uh, under the banner of Our Burning Planet, making up somewhat for all the climate denial you'd published previously. David, I just have to say that was not under the banner of Our Burning Planet, but we did have some, some rather outspoken commentators on that subject who are no longer writing for Daily Maverick. Um, and uh, David is lamenting that we don't have a, a representative on this panel of one of the many civil society organizations working on climate change. Thank you, David. We'll bear that in mind for a, a, a future webinar. Um, and so he's really keen on having the civil society point of view represented. He has a few questions for APSA. Um, David, that would be for you. Just how many loans to fossil fuel companies do you currently have on your box? Um, David LePage asks. Um, he wants to know uh, why did APSA uh, refuse to rule out um, supporting uh, the car power ships, which would have run on natural gas? Um, and uh, and then his final question is the fossil fuel industry does indeed claim that gas is a bridge fuel but no scientist with any credibility considers it a climate solution so a few tough questions from um, from civil society there david yeah that, i think it's great and maybe i can take up the last one I, I kind of agree with that point i haven't seen any science around gas and it, and it's it's in the construct of uh a transitional environment where perhaps the, the capacity within storage to um, store power, which is, which is produced from wind and solar, is not at the advanced stage. And there is a discussion, how do you protect economies and societies, as we've spoken about already, in that, in that journey? So I, I think it's a very good point. In terms of, of funding fossil fuels, I think it was disclosed recently through our whole AGM process, we have less than 1% of our loans and advances our exposure directly to the fossil fuel industry. But again, I want to caution that it, it, is, it is a good question and it's one which you need to hold financial institutions accountable for, but it's that whole, that whole thing, which uh, that whole spectrum of corporates which sits in the middle, which we also need, need to tackle. And then the, the, the third question, which was around car power, I think it's, it's important that um, we are very big supporter of renewable energy within South Africa. Roughly 46% of all the IPP projects, we've led or, or played a leading role in financing them. So we are we also a strong partner with people like the IPP office in terms of what they're trying to deliver within the, within the economy. So we always have to look at everything on a case by case situation. And it's very clear that the, these discussions as we've spoken about today are often complex and they they lay it in detail and assessment. And so, you know, we're not gonna make any decisions until we kind of 
completed due diligence, which I think is prudent to do as, as an institution. And as our and as our interim CEO referenced, I think in some of the questions post our last AGM, you know, we are not in a we we're definitely not gonna we're not gonna put a reputation of being one of the leaders in renewable energy finance in this market. We're not gonna put that reputation at risk through one particular project which doesn't meet the appropriate environmental standards. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and one can certainly understand that. Um, but natural gas is a is a really tricky one. Um, it's uh, it's still very much a, a fossil fuel, and uh, there's a massive emphasis these days on um, pushing a, a natural gas as a, a so-called transition fuel. And yet, it comes with uh, a tremendous destruction. So, for example. Um, Russia has is is digging up um, uh, a huge section of the Yarmal Peninsula, uh, which is the biggest uh, estuary uh, in the uh, um, Arctic. Um, it is uh, hugely sensitive ecologically, and so what we're seeing here is Russia uh, transporting this natural gas all the way from the Yarmal Peninsula around the northern sea route. Uh, in the Arctic, uh, our burning planet was was uh, very much instrumental in reporting on this earlier this year, and uh, this is now going towards um, Asia uh, for the very first time um, uh, in an Arctic winter. Uh, commercial vessels crossed paths in the northern sea route, so this really means that that area is open for business now. It's, it's showing us how fast uh, that passage is melting, and we are seeing masses of uh, of, of natural gas being shipped from um, from the Yarmal Peninsula into Asia Pacific. So. Uh, uh, Gillian, um, is is this a, a trend that we as journalists should be concerned about? Um, and how do we approach this this chestnut of so-called clean energy and natural gas being being lumped in, into that category, same category? I think it's definitely an area that we need to to, to focus on. And I think um, first and foremost, as journalists, we need to to improve our knowledge on this particular area um, and not be caught up in the, the the clean speak, if I can put it that, that way. We need to ask critical questions about what has been done, where it's been done, what's the impact of that particular action, that that uh, search for that natural gas in that, those often very sensitive uh, environmentally areas are, um, you know, you've got, you've got uh, the, the, the exploration in in um, the Antarctic you've got uh, some some thought of, of exploring off of KZN coast the the Karoo fracking initiative those are those are things that we need to be, become more knowledgeable about so that yes. we can ask the questions that need to be asked you know yes. we all we all are suffering from from the the power shortage but we shouldn't just look to what is most convenient and what is what is easy because those 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 decisions will have long lasting impacts not yeah. necessarily on ourselves now but on future generations and so everything that we do um as journalists must must really be a, a question of what is happening now and what impact is it going to have on the future mm -hmm. David, I, I just want to stay with this, this natural gas issue for a, a moment longer. Um, would you, as I guess, can I ask you to take off your banker's hat for just a second? Um, as, a, as, a, as a concerned citizen, how do you view this natural gas transition and uh, and uh, how concerned are you about the fact that so much emphasis is being placed on natural gas as a transition fuel when actually we have a world of um, renewable energy available to us? And then, I guess, as an investment banker, how do you, how do you straddle those tensions between renewable energy, um, the technology is available to us, and a natural gas? Look, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good question and something which... You know, as we try to formulate our strategy, which is a key component of, is is how do you get that balance right in emerging markets? 
and when we, th we thought about it, we thought about our footprint on a, on a Pan-Africa basis. On the one hand, you know, the, the easy one is I spoke about you know, the, the number of households that rely on burning coal just for basic power, right? Mm. In terms of decentralized power, to put a renewable energy or some form of solar on that rural development, that makes complete sense, right? There's no reason why that cannot be accelerated. So instead of building this huge grid from a coal-fired power station to a rural community, that the technology is there that you don't need that anymore, right? So, so that so that is kind of the the quick one. The, the the more challenging one, of course, is how do you, how do you move from where the technology is not there right now? And I'm, I'm not an expert in the the whole development of kind of storage, etc. But it feels like there is significant amount of energy, capital, and human energy going into actually sorting this out. So. The quicker that can develop, the more storage yeah, works that you can harness the sun and the wind and you can make sure that there is a, a, a continual supply of energy when it, the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. Um, mm -hmm. so, so you need to continue to invest in that. And then on the, so, so the gas side is, is complicated. So, so for me, mm -hmm. is if, the, if, it's, if it's to support a very clear transition, so for example, we haven't released our formal oil and gas policy, but we're not going to support any form of exploration when it comes to oil and gas as, as an organization. Mm -hmm. we, we're simply not going to do that. But are, the, are there, is there assets which are currently in place which you can need to work with to facilitate a transition? For me, when you're trying to balance this, as and that's why I started off in terms of emerging markets, trying to balance environmental protection and and this inclusive growth agenda, they're both very important. So it almost comes down to project by project is you've got to think about is this, is this good in the short term and is this good in the long term? Mm. Mm. We have uh, an interesting question from Lorraine Chaponda, uh, and she is asking, other than divesting, how about the rehabilitation, reclamation and climate debt? Will they pay that too? I'm assuming by they, they she means the private sector. Uh, what is the discussion by corporates on payment of climate debt, uh, particularly those that have operated for decades causing climate and environmental harm through financing um, and uh, projects they implement? David, I think that is probably a question for you. Um. Look, look. I think it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting one because if if you just look at look at the mining industry, you know there, there's been a lot of issues. And Jillian, probably you probably covered this a number of times in your career around uh, rehabilitation of mining assets and our big business kind of greenwashing or unbundling. So in some respects, this is not a new a new issue, right? It's actually been around in South Africa for the better part of twenty to thirty years, where where international mining houses or even domestic mining houses have sold off mines close towards the end of useful life simply to avoid kind of rehabilitation costs. And of course, there's legislation around that and there's guarantees and environmental bonds. But uh, I, I think this is, a, this is a great topic to have. And I don't think mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's formalized itself yet when it comes to kind of the, the immediate um, issues of the day. But it's it's not it's not a new concept, and and so I think it's I think it's it would be useful to see how this well no doubt it's going to unfold over the coming years as to I think as opposed to the debt it's almost what penalties are there for those that have done wrong in the past, yeah. or yeah. what what remedial action are those entities doing to um, to know, atone for their sins? If they... Yeah. Um... Uh, I'm I'm really uh, just fascinated by the questions that are coming through. They uh, are very diverse and um, and they speak to a very um, switched on audience. Um, and uh, Zintle Razia asks, uh, and she says, "This is a brilliant discussion. I'm wondering whether there has been uh, whether there have been any developments on supporting initiatives that primarily address." behavioral change when it comes to the green economy. I think she's talking about consumer education. 
um, uh, around renewable energy is important in changing mindsets on how consumers start to change their patterns when it comes to transitioning to a green economy. Um, how do corporates envision playing a meaningful role in providing awareness to citizens? And I think this is a question for, for David and Gillian. How can uh, uh, the corporate, uh, the private sector address uh, meaningful awareness raising as well as um, media? Uh, Jill, do you, want to, do you want to start? Yeah, I think, you know, um, education is part of what we do as journalists. Um, it's 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 in the in the way we do our write our stories. Mm. Um, education should be part of of our thinking when we do those stories. Um, but it's also our responsibility and our job to go and find organisations who are doing this kind of work and feature them in 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 our 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 journalistic mix. You know, um, people who are working on the ground in communities trying to to change mindsets um to feature some of those that, that the work that's been done there the um the conversations that have been happening i mean any community you go you go into there is a champion for for these kinds of causes for mm -hmm. um you know uh, 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 let's say uh, uh, localized farming in your backyard how mm -hmm. can you go about doing it let's feature them let's talk to them let's see what's happening uh, let's educate people on various different things that they that they can change and have power within themselves to to make those changes um you know i think i think if we empower people to make informed choices uh we are on the road to making broader change i keep coming back to to individual change making impact on a, on a greater scale and and that is through through educating people Yes, um, yes. About the different issues. Yes, and uh, and taking it one step on from education, it's it's very much about engagement. Um, mm. So, uh, David, how can the banking sector engage with consumers on all levels to make them aware of um, of uh, fundamental global change issues and climate um, crisis um, issues? Look, I think it almost goes back to those three pillars which I described in the strategy, and one of them is the discussion we're having today. The, the middle one is, is a discussion we're having, and we sit in a fairly privileged position that quite often we're in the strategic discussion with the corporates. So they are definitely, the, your large corporates in South Africa, this is definitely a, a board level engagement or discussion at this point in time. So they're acutely aware of how do they reshape their business and how do they reshape their balance sheet going into or to adapt to this trend in the future. And then the mm -hmm. third aspect is around kind of the products and services, which as a bank you deliver to the market and how do you drive some of this change agenda through the products and services? Do, do you, the concept of a green deposit. So in other words, someone or corporate deposits money with a bank and they will only deposit the money with a bank with a, a, a specific interest rate, provided that money is used for a renewable energy project, for example. And so you're starting to see these types of products come to market quite quickly. And that that's great for the consumer because then they, they actually start to have a little, a little bit more choice. I think yeah. the other is, going back to that middle pillar, is that what you're starting to see at a lot of AGMs of your large listed entities, the questions are being asked of the boards. Do they have the right representation at the board level to actually address these issues, which I think is a big positive. Great. We are um, uh, running out of time. Um, I, I think we have time for just, um, I guess, um, final comments. And um, I'm just very interested in uh, this, you know, this, this pandemic has been, <laughs> like I said at the beginning of this conversation, it's been a strange time for all of us. Um, ecological grief is, is something that a lot of people are dealing with. Um, uh, Exis the word existential has become such a fundamental part of our daily conversation. So I want to hear from both uh, David and Jill, just um, uh, closing remarks. Um, and maybe, Jill, let's, let's start with you. Um, 
and, and I think this is important because journalists pick up a lot of flack just for being journalists and even more so climate journalists. <laughs> how, um, how does your job um, act as a lodestar to guide you through this difficult time and, and what drives you personally? Personally, as a journalist, or personally within this particular field, I think um, uh, you know they they combined. But but if I focus on on um, the owl burning planet and and my motivation there, um, it it really comes down to to a base realization that that I need the earth more than the earth needs me. Mm. You know, if if each and every one of us disappears off the face of the earth today, Mother Nature is going to regenerate she's going to come back and she's going to heal herself you know um the damage that we are wroughting on 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 the planet is detrimental to us yeah um and and that's a great motivator to 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 really start critically thinking about what we're doing you know um future generations again rely on us to make very difficult sometimes uncomfortable decisions about how we live our lives um, to ensure that there is still something here mm. for for mm. those to come, um, mm. yeah. I mean, I think I think that's that's the base of of the motivation to do what I do. Okay, David, um, and and over to you. Uh, be, before the pandemic, I guess this question might have felt like lip service, but um, everyone has been kicked awake by um, by this uh, the pandemic at some point. Um, and uh, and I guess um, the climate crisis is is very much on the same level. Having a handle on how climate will affect your job and your life going forward, how does your job um, galvanize you to get a better night's rest? Well, I, I, it, it almost goes back to pre-pandemic, and this is a very much a personal view, sharing on a very open platform, is that, and, and I think a lot of the colleagues I work with felt that you kind of had the work life, the family unit, and the environment. And did they really intersect? But kind of in the, what you've seen is that, you know, we this whole work from home environment driven by and environmental effects being a disease has really, you know, broken that down, that people need to realize that those three are not mutually exclusive. They mm -hmm. completely codependent on each other. And so mm -hmm. for me, that it, it's a, it's, it seems so obvious, but it, but it clearly wasn't for, for myself and for a lot of people. And for me, that's, that's driving this is, is the one thing. The other is that, mm -hmm. you know, we sit in a world where there is an, a, an abundance of information and there is abundance of information on this topic. What what we you know what I'm passionate about is taking that information, pulling it towards solutions, and actually hoping to deliver actions. Otherwise, it will be a complete waste of just having, as I said, an abundance of information on environmental um, issues and not actually doing anything about it. You know, the, it, yeah. everyone can become an expert on the issues. It the challenge is how do you take that into solutions and into actions. Okay, well, I think that we are almost very much out of time. Um, uh, David, thank you so much for your time today. And um, Joel, thank you so much um, for taking uh, time out of your very pressing schedule to join us. No, thanks for, thanks thank for having, having me part of the discussion and I yeah. look forward to engaging more with, with you and David and, and the very engaged commentators on the chat. I think there's, there's some good options to follow up on there. Thank you. Closing remarks from my side. I guess what this conversa conversation has shown us today is that there's still much left to fight for and solve collectively, whether you're a business executive, entrepreneur, parent, child, or even a lowly journalist. Um, speaking of which, you can stay abreast of the finest global change and climate crisis investigations by signing up to the Our Burning Planet newsletter. It is free and it comes straight to your inbox 
every two weeks with the very latest in African and international global change news. I'm sure that our webinar angel, Nicole, will have posted that link in the chat window by now. For now, thanks to APSA for supporting this webinar and enabling our work. Thanks to our panelists again, David Rennick and Gillian Green for joining us and to our very special audience. And thanks as ever to our Maverick Insiders for helping keep our journalism free, fair, honest and independent. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.